Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers, welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Happy Friday to you. Hope you have something planned for the weekend that's fun, relaxing. Maybe you have to work. Whatever you're doing, I hope it's awesome. I plan to keep working on the podcast, the graphics, the website. I'm trying to get an app put together that everybody can download and have everything right there in an app on your phone. It might be a while before that's out, though, knowing me. You know, I said I was going to write a book on Lori Vallow's trial and the whole case in general. I've got three paragraphs written so far. That may never happen, y'all. Not even kidding. Before we get into what I am titling Doomsday Deja Vu, I'm not going to do a music fact, more of a question for you guys. What are some of the funnier misheard lyrics either you sang or you heard? When Sarah Rose was four, her favorite song was Tiny Dancer. So she would sing Count the Headlice on the highway, Headlice, Creepy Crawlies. She got those one time in preschool. I was about to burn the house down and just move out, but I took her to professionals. They got rid of it. I fumigated the house, never had it again, but Lord have mercy. So let me know in the comments, by the way, if you're watching this on YouTube, give this video a like. The more likes the video gets, the more YouTube pushes it out. So please do me a favor and hit like. If you're not subscribed, hit that subscribe button. If you want updates to your devices when I upload a video, you can hit that bell notification. I'm trying to utilize shorts a lot more just because it's convenient when there's a Little piece of breaking news, but not enough for a whole episode. So if you can do that, that would be great. Also, thank you to Debbie for your generous donation. I appreciate you so much. I've had some people ask, what are the best ways to donate? Because word's starting to get around that YouTube takes a pretty good cut of super thanks and super chats, which they do. All my links are always in the description. The other thing I'm working on is trying to get something in the online store that is a pay what you want. So it might be a really cool sticker. You could pay a dollar, you could pay whatever you want for it, and that would be another way to donate. Those are the best ways. And when people donate, I put every penny of that into a savings account for the podcast. So when something breaks or something quits working, I can go get that without having to wait days or weeks to do a new episode. It's very convenient. When I'm traveling, I also use that just to sort of back up money in case I need it. So thank you to everybody who chooses to support the podcast that way. And if you can't, I'm just happy you're here. All right, here we go again. It felt like 2019 all over again. Nate Eaton breaks a story about some doomsday beliefs. Well, in this case, there is a missing kid. Very, very similar to Vala Daybell. In the meantime, follow Nate Eaton all across social media. Keep an eye on eastidahonews.com. He is the one with all the goods on this case. Also, Justin Lum is working on a story about this, so be sure to keep an eye out for that to drop. I'm going to post a link in the description here to East Idaho News where Nate Eaton interviewed the father of Blaze, who is missing. He's 16 years old. And also, he posted an interview with Abby's husband, Braden. They give a lot of insight into what led up to them disappearing and pretty much got all my information from Nate Eaton's website and his interviews this is a very important thing. We have a little bit of a time advantage as opposed to Valo Daybell because by the time we found them, the kids were already deceased and Charles had been shot earlier that year. Tammy Daybell had been killed as well. So time is of the essence and we just want to get the word out. Now, Blaze Thibodeau, I'm going to put uh, who's who up here on screen if you're on YouTube. You have Spring Thibodeau, who is the mother of Abby Snar, and Blaze Thibodeau, who is missing. He is 16 years old. You also have Brooke Hale, is the brother of Spring. Abby, Brooke, and Spring pretty much share a lot of the doomsday, into the world, second coming of Christ ideas that Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell did, and their whole group. And yes, Julie Rowe is mentioned, and we'll talk about her in just a second. Now, who's Blaze Thibodeau? He was reported missing by his father, Ben, after his mother, Spring, his 24-year-old sister, Abby Snar, and Uncle Brooke Hale bought thousands of dollars of survival gear and flew to Boise, Idaho just this past Monday to prepare for the second coming. They have not been heard from since. The last car they were seen in was a 2004 white Lexus GX470. I have a picture of that on screen now, but the difference is this. According to Ben, who is Blaze's father, they have modified this car for off-road use now. It has pink tow hooks on the front. It has a lift now, and there are 33-inch off-road tires on that car, so it's going to look a lot different than what it does on the screen here. His dad thinks they could still be in the Boise area, Coeur d'Alene, or maybe on the other side of the border in Oregon. Now, when I was in Boise, 
it's maybe a 40 minute drive to the Oregon border. I made that trip several times in my time up there covering Lori Vallow's trial. He has heard that Spring and Abby have been planning to leave since the day before on Sunday. Spring, Abby, and Blaze are from Gilbert, Arizona. If that sounds familiar, it's because that is where Lori Vallow was. That's where Alex Cox was. This is where a lot of the planning into these murders and this cult and the move and everything else took place. Brooke, who is Spring's brother and the uncle to Blaze and Abby, is from Provo, Utah. Now, Spring, Abby, and Brooke believe that Blaze is a Davidic servant, which is a chosen individual who plays a big role in the Savior's return. They thought that Blaze needed to be kept safe. And in order for Blaze to receive his divine calling and to understand his role in the second coming of Christ, they needed to take him to an undisclosed location. His father, Ben, said that Blaze was not into the doomsday mindset. And he told Nate Eaton from East Idaho News, he is in no way a supporter of anything she's ever believed. He is your typical teenager and all he wants to do is hang out with friends and be on his phone. He's on the football team and has worked so hard to be on that football team. They still have games left this season. There's no way he would have gone along with it. He thinks there's a chance they coerced him into going, sedated him, possibly threatened him. Blaze's dad said that Abby's husband, Braden, heard Blaze was possibly lured into going under false pretenses by promising him an early birthday trip. Blaze turns 17 on November the 8th. His mom pulled him out of school on Monday at 10 a.m. He said that Blaze would have probably quickly figured out there was no birthday trip, and he said that worries him. He thinks that in this whole group, the Uncle Brooke would be the aggressor and could act on that if things don't go the way he wants them to go. He's worried for the safety of Blaze, saying if Blaze isn't cooperative, he worries that his brother-in-law, Brooke, would restrain or incapacitate him. We know with Lori and Chad's case, in the beginning, nobody really that knew them thought that Lori would be capable of hurting her kids. When these people subscribe to these wackadoodle beliefs, all bets are off the table, right? They totally believe they are not of this world and that the rules of this world don't apply. So time is of the essence that Blaze is found unharmed. In April, Spring told her husband she wanted to live separately. So he moved out, but they still did things together like go out to dinner and they would attend their church services together. He said they were cordial, but she also said that there was a secret combination within the church leaders who were covering up his sins. There was a dissolution petition filed just last week between the two of them. She had been wanting to divorce Ben. However, she did not want to initiate it because those records are public in Arizona. Since Ben filed the dissolution paperwork, he was able to get an emergency motion from a judge on Tuesday, the day after they left, for sole emergency custody and also for Blaze to be returned to him ASAP. This also enables law enforcement to get involved and find Blaze and bring him home. Right before I started this episode, I checked for updates, and it looks like now the FBI is involved, which is a lot quicker than in Valo Daybell. He has filed a missing person report with the Gilbert Police Department, and Blaze has been entered into the NCIC, which is a National Crime Information Center, and they're working on getting an Amber Alert out. He said the Boise Police Department was unwilling to get involved. They took a report, but Gilbert PD is the main agency that is handling this case at the moment. How did all this begin? Like I say, deja vu. Spring has always been a church-going, temple-worthy person. She served in callings within their church, but on the flip side, she had always been fascinated with end of times. She really started getting in the thick of it back in 2015. Here's where a familiar name comes in. She got heavily involved with Julie Rowe. Now, if you followed the Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell case, you know, Julie Rowe was a friend of Chad's. He published some of her books. She said she was friends with Tammy, although she never thought it important to tell Tammy that on more than one occasion, Chad said he had visions she was going to die. They parted ways, and I'm not going to get into a huge backstory of Julie, but she has freely spoken out about her time with Lori and Chad, like everybody else in that circle, tried to distance herself as much as she could and their wackadoodle beliefs. But if you're on YouTube and on the audio version, you'll be able to hear this. I'm going to play a quick little snippet from Julie Rose TikTok. My name is Julie Rowe. I'm an energy practitioner. I've had several near-death experiences, out-of-bodies, and 
astral projections. I'm able to see past, present, and future. Spring was asked to be a scribe for revelations that Julia was receiving. I guess in between her little ribbon baton twirling, she gets revelations. Spring started also attending these energy healing sessions. That's something that Julie Rowe that came into the Lori Vallow Chad Daybell case. And she started spending a lot of money on food prepping, winter gear, in spite of the fact that they lived in Arizona and it's hot as Hades out there. She was also buying tents. Spring thinks that the saints will gather in the mountains for the last days. Nate asked why Idaho to Ben, the father of Blaze and Abby. He said he's not sure why they chose Idaho, but he also believes that came from Julie Rowe about Idaho being a safe place to gather, but ultimately he doesn't know why. It's kind of the same reason that Lori moved up to Idaho is because Chad told her that Rexburg was kind of the chosen place and how convenient that Chad lived in Rexburg. She started reading books, especially by a man named Abraham Gileotti. He was a longtime professor at Brigham Young University and was also one of the September 6th of prominent scholars who were excommunicated by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints back in 1993. Several years later, he was formally readmitted into the church and insists that his excommunication was recognized by church leadership as an oopsie, a mistake. He later told the Salt Lake Tribune, in my case, not a single charge was true or supported by evidence, and all mention of it was expunged from the church's records. He has written 10 books, a lot of those focusing around the book of Isaiah. What's significant about the book of Isaiah? Well, Nephi, you remember that name from Lori Vallow, wrote that those living in the last days would be able to understand Isaiah's words. Nephi said Isaiah's words can be plain unto all those that are filled with the spirit of the prophecy. Over time, her husband, Ben, started to worry because this was escalating, and he talked to Spring about it. He wanted to have the both of them talk to their bishop, so they did, and the bishop advised Spring to stop the path she was on or their marriage was not going to survive. So Spring hit the brakes on her involvement with Julie Rowe, but Ben felt that Spring was already indoctrinated with everything she had learned, listened to, watched, read, all that stuff. She also was having dreams. Then she involved their daughter, Abby, into the fold about two and a half years ago, and Spring's brother, Brooke, was brought in about a year and a half ago. He was brought in at a time where he was experiencing a huge crisis in his marriage, and he was said to have taken this and ran with it. Does that remind you of Alex Cox? If you know the Valo Daybell case, you bring the brother in, takes it, and runs. Scary thoughts, y'all. Lo and behold, after Abby comes in the fold, she starts having dreams herself. And this drove her and her mom to share their dreams together. And they both felt they were able to interpret those dreams into bigger meanings. Brooke, Spring, and Abby were said to have spent hours every day on the phone. And that was multiple times a day for the last year and a half. Ben checked those phone records and the calls were constant. Abby's husband, Braden Snar, also talked to Nate over at East Idaho News. They were married in June of 2021. He said they were very close. They were never apart. In fact, what's ironic is this. Just a couple of years ago, East Idaho News did a story on Abby and Braden because they had opened up a gym there in East Idaho, where they were living at the time. With this and how it goes with Abby, it reminds me a lot of Melanie's of how all of a sudden she up and leaves. They moved to Gilbert, Arizona in August of 2022. About six months into the marriage, Abby told him about a dream she had of the last days, which led to them buying a lot of food storage to last two years. Braden was on board with that. And by the way, his dad also worked for a food storage company in Utah. He told Nate Eaton, I was comfortable doing it because I think preparedness is something we should all strive for. But over time, it started to get more and more, for a lack of a better term, radical. It started to get more deep, and she connected with a bunch of different individuals with similar beliefs. She would watch sermons from evangelical pastors from across the country that also had dreams and the sermons focused on the second coming, and they would discuss all of this together, her mom and her uncle. He said he knew for the last year and a half that Abby, Spring, and Brooke had been having dreams that the end of times are near. And so around six months ago, Abby asked Braden if he would be willing to leave their home if it was necessary. He told Nate, my response to her was, yes, if we were going to be invaded by another country or our lives were in jeopardy, I would obviously not be in Phoenix in my apartment. I would leave. 
And he thought that's what she meant by asking, would you leave? He said her belief spiraled down. He said the weekend, the both of them, very normal. They went on date night, nothing out of the ordinary. But on Monday morning at 9.54 a.m. while he was at work, she called him and under the ruse that he needed to come home ASAP and take her to the hospital, he rushed home. But when he got there, the first thing he noticed is their doorbell camera had been taken down. And when he walked into the apartment, he said it was a mess. She had gone and purchased a bunch of hunting, utility camping gear from Sportsman's Warehouse. And she told me that it's time for us to leave and that I needed to go with her. He said he was baffled. He asked where they were going. And Abby said that herself, Brayden, her mother and her brother needed to get to the airport ASAP because they had booked a flight to Boise. At this point, this was around 10.30 a.m. when this was happening. She said they needed to leave by 11 a.m. and that they had bought him a ticket and that her Uncle Brooke would pick them up from there. When asked, well, where are we going to go after that? She said she could not tell where they were going until they got there. He said when she was packing, she said she needed her passport, so he went and got it for her. He thinks that it makes sense. Maybe they were heading to Canada since they had bought all of this really heavy winter gear. If not Canada, then somewhere very remote. I think if they haven't crossed the border, their chances are pretty much zero at this point because the FBI is involved. And so they're already checking, I'm sure, into seeing if they did cross the border anywhere. Also, if they do try to cross, they're going to be on a list of people that you don't let cross and then you detain and call authorities. Abby took $4,000 cash that they had in their apartment and also her credit card. He said he has heard in talking to family that Uncle Brooke may have had up to $150,000 on him. He said, I believe their purpose is just to try to wait this out. They're thinking events are going to be happening soon and that they need to be away for safety. He told Nate, I love her. She is the love of my life. And she comes in and says, it's time to go and I'm not coming back. He said, it's one of those experiences where part of you is like, I can't let you go. I have to go with you, even if it makes no logical sense, because that's the one you love. She's everything that I have. But deep down inside me, I knew this couldn't be true. The world is going to continue to keep spinning and I can't just leave Phoenix. He told her to take whatever she needed to. When he refused, Abby called her uncle, who read scripture to Braden in an effort to change his mind about joining them, and he also shared some dreams that he had had with Braden. Braden told Nate Eaton that he was basically telling me that I will receive a witness after the trial of my faith and also to trust God, because that's his plan. I'm a part of this with them, and it's supposed to be the five of us. Brooke told Braden he needed to be like Zoram, who in the Book of Mormon, he is a servant of Laban who joined with Nephi and Lehi to come to the promised land. He told Braden just to have faith. Well, after the call, Braden was uncomfortable and shocked. He said, I told her I just can't do it. I can't do it. He said he needed to get out of there if her mother and brother were coming. So he was helping her pack and weigh the bags, but eventually went outside to his car within their apartment complex. Around 11 a.m. on Monday, Spring and Blaze pulled up with Spring driving and Blaze in the front seat. Abby comes down with her luggage, put her stuff in the car, and then they left. He sent a few texts to Abby after they left telling her that he loved her and that he could not believe this was happening and said none of this made sense as far as what they were planning and said, you know, there's consequences to this. They're going to find you. She texted him back telling him to pray about this and that he still could come and take the flight with them. She said, I love you. We will be back in a few years. And if you're still around, I'll come find you. He said in this time frame, he called his own father and asked him to come to Arizona to be with him. So he flew his dad out there so he wasn't alone. He told Abby that he had called his dad and the last text from her was around 11.30 to 11.40 a.m. that said, okay, with a red heart. And then that was the last time he heard from her. So far, there's been no signs of any credit card use within the group or any signs from their bank accounts. So they're really off the grid. Braden actually held up to the camera doing this remote interview with Nate eating things that was left for him, including food bars. He said they did take food with them as well in their luggage. He doesn't know if they left them out of concern for him or that they ran out of room in their bags, but he thinks it's a little bit of both. Braden called Ben, who is Blaze and Abby's dad, and said their worst nightmares have come true. They have left. They're gone. Ben tried to call all three, but got no answer. Nate Eaton, by the way, also tried to call Spring and Abby's phone, 
which went to voicemail. And it seems like Brooke's phone has been disconnected. Remember when Colby tried to call his mom and couldn't get her? It had been disconnected. He then emailed her and she said that he had to trust her. And that was the last time that he talked to her. Gilbert PD issued a statement to East Idaho News saying, on Wednesday, October 25th, 2023, the Gilbert Police Department began investigating an alleged custodial interference involving 16-year-old Blaze Thibodeau. Thibodeau is believed to have been taken out of Arizona by his mother, Spring, and the pair are believed to be traveling with two family members. Boise police confirmed through surveillance that they did land at Boise Airport Abby was seen with a phone in her hand, and then they got into that Lexus that has pink tow hooks on the front, the lift, and the 33-inch tires now. That was being driven by Uncle Brooke with dealer plates on the back. They did find a conversation on another device where Abby said Spring did not have her phone with her. Brooke was telling Abby to keep Blaze away from her phone. Remember they did that with Tylee where Lori took Tylee's phone and then Melanie had asked Lori if Tylee had her phone. This was after Charles was shot and Lori said, no, I still have it. Now, Brooke, who we know is going through a contentious divorce, wrote a last will and testament to his children this past Monday, the day they all left. After Ben was made aware that Spring, Blaze, and Abby had left, he called Brooke's family and asked if they knew what in the world was going on. Brooke's family went to the house he was staying in. Then they found the document. It was two and a half pages long. Brooke liquidated everything. And according to Ben, he got $50,000 in cash out. Now, Braden said it could be $100,000 more than that. He moved monies into his three children's account, as well as his estranged wife's, and told where he wanted all of his assets to go. I mean, this is scary stuff. Like, this is, you've got... Abby saying, we'll be back in a few years. I'll find you if I can. And now you've got Brooke giving everything away. In the document, he also shared his faith and his beliefs. It said, if you are reading this right now, it means that I'm gone. I don't know where I'm going. I was not told. You will not see me for some time. How long? I do not know, but I will see you again. He also said amazing things were going to happen very soon with the return of the Savior. Now, Ben thinks Brooke had been planning this for a while, and he believes that Brooke is the financer and the planner as far as where they go and where they're staying. He thinks financially they could be on the run for a little while. He says none of them like the cold. They're not outdoorsy people, so they really don't know survival skills. Ben thought that Spring would leave with another group of people, maybe, that were like-minded, but never anything like this, and he was super shocked that she involved Blaze in this. Ben is currently in Boise, and he doesn't know how long he's going to stay up there. He got very emotional talking to Nate Eaton about this. He said he bought a one-way ticket, and he's willing to lose his job to stay there. He said he's just taking it day by day. They also have other children, one of which is on a mission in Africa. Nate asked how he was holding up, and Ben said that he is just trying to stay strong for his other children, but it's very hard. He said they're all good people. They're wonderful people. But getting into these dark topics has really corrupted them in a really horrible way. But they are genuinely just loving, kind people before any of this unfolded. Braden said that Blaze is a smart young man. And he said, my hope is that Blaze realizes that's not what's going on, meaning the early birthday trip. He can either play into it a little bit or figure out a point when they're vulnerable and escape. Then we can find him and work that direction. It's my prayer he can somehow get away. His father, Ben, said Blaze absolutely would want to get away and would likely say, this is stupid, get me out of here. He said if they went to a public space, he's sure they would have to restrain Blaze in some way. He thinks Brooke and Abby would be the ones to do that. He said if he could say anything to them right now, it would be to come back. We love you. Nothing will change in their relationships, and it's never too late to say you've made a mistake. He wants to support them, and he also wants to help them heal. Braden said if he could talk to them right now, he would say that he loves them, and he knows that faith and conviction are very powerful, and you can get pulled away from reality. But they need them home safe, and they can work through everything else. He doesn't know if Abby and Blaze are in danger. Nothing seemed hostile, but more of them acting out of their belief and conviction. But again, that's where I say, look at Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, nobody that knew them before we knew them in the headlines. 
would have probably said they were a danger to anybody's lives. This stuff takes on a new form and it seems to just infect the people and they're convinced of this stuff. It just blows my mind that you got Chad Daybell telling people, you know, I was the brother of Jesus in a past life and people are like, wow, cool. Okay. Braden also thinks they're in fight or flight mode and they're acting on that. But he said the nature of it is very scary and also is scary knowing Blaze is in the middle of this. Anyone with information on the whereabouts of Blaze Thibodeau is asked to call the Gilbert PD at 480-503-6500. Reference report number 23-161023. Blaze is 16 years old, 6 foot 2, weighs approximately 180 pounds with light blondish brown hair and striking green and blue eyes. Very handsome young man. Just frightening stuff because we've been here before. And it seems like these people very closely believed the same thing that Lori and Chad did. I'm going to keep up with this. I've got a million alerts set on my phone between Nate Eaton, Justin Lum, East Idaho News, Gilbert PD. So if anything happens in this case, I'll probably do a little short about it if it's a, a resolution to the case before I do a big episode. So look for it there. In the meantime, share this video. Time is of the essence. As we know, it may not be too late to safely locate Blaze and get him back to his dad. I have to say his dad, Ben, seems like the nicest guy. And you can tell he loves not only his son and daughter, but his wife. And he's worried about her. Same goes for Braden. Just seems like a, a really sweet young man. And so let's just hope the resolution in this case is a lot more positive than the one we saw play out four years ago. All right, guys, that's it. We'll see you soon.